All right, why don't we get started? Um, so thank you for joining us on this really nice day. It's kind of weird. I have to apologize in, in Duluth, Minnesota for people coming out both on nice and bad days, right? Uh, so if it's bad, I'm, I'm amazed you came. If it's nice, I'm still amazed you came because of the weather. Just a weird Duluth fact. Uh, <laughs> now, um, Today's talk, first of all, I have to say, is, is sponsored by uh, the Institute for Humane Studies. They were, through a generous grant from the John Templeton Foundation, able to provide the funding for tonight's speaker. Without them, we couldn't have done this. That being said, we do have surveys that we'd like you to fill out, right? just saying how much you like the speaker, how much you like the topic, and so forth. Um, this uh, should be relatively painless. The good news about it is there is an incentive involved. Uh, they usually pick out one person from each talk to give at least, I think, a $10 Amazon gift certificate. So there is something involved. Um, also, I'd like to mention that after this talk, uh, Dr. Smith will be signing his books um, outside this room here. So if, if you're interested in that as well, uh, please come and see him. There'll be the door, the desk will be right outside that door over yonder. Uh, so a little bit about Dr. Jeffrey Smith. Um, Dr. Smith is an assistant professor currently right now at the New School. He's also taught at uh, Washington University in Dartmouth as well. Um, he served in the Missouri Senate from 2006 to 2009. Uh, he was representing at that time St. Louis City. Uh, he's also published a, a number of books, right? One of them, of course, being the book he'll be signing today, which is Mr. Smith Goes to Prison. That was published in 2015, so just recently. Uh, also, he published uh, Ferguson in Black and White. Uh, Dr. Smith frequently appears on MSNBC and has been profiled by NPR's This American Life, Harper's, The New Republic, and other periodicals. Uh, he addresses audience and public officials and ethics and politics. His TED Talk... Uh, on prison entrepreneurship has been viewed well over a million times. Uh, his co-op, co or sorry, his op-eds, sorry about that, uh, have been published by the New York Times, the New Republic, CNN.com, The Atlantic, um, National Journal, Salon, Political Magazine, New York Magazine, BuzzFeed, and the Chicago Tribune. Uh, the film, Can Mr. Smith Get to Washington Anymore? Uh, was shortlisted uh, for an Academy Award. Uh, it chronicled this movie, uh, his youth-powered grassroots congressional campaign. Uh, he currently serves on the national advisory boards of the Prison Entrepreneurship Program and the American Prison Data Systems. So without further ado, because I could do a much more ados, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Smith. Thank you very much, Dr. Hartman. I uh, appreciate the generous introduction. Thanks, everybody, for coming out on a nice night. So, this talk is going to be broken up into two parts. Uh, both are going to be connected by one theme. And the theme is the different ways in which public policies create perverse incentives for law enforcement to do things that they absolutely should not be doing because they're not for the welfare of citizens. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Ferguson. How many of you followed the unrest that, that took place in Ferguson about a year and a half ago? Raise your hand. Um, OK. So Ferguson is up uh, in kind of the northwest corner. This is a map of St. Louis City and St. Louis County. And I'm going to talk uh, in depth about the ways that public policy and the fragmentation of St. Louis contributed to the unrest that we saw. Um, but first, I want to give a little bit of a personal take. I think the whole world was riveted when Ferguson was burning. You know, people were watching on TV from, from around the world. And uh, so was I. But I think the key unanswered question about Ferguson was what made Ferguson different from so many other towns where you've seen similar killings of, of unarmed men, usually people of color? Why did Ferguson explode when so few other cities have, uh, although Baltimore, of course, did after that. And, you know, what about Sanford, Florida, when Trayvon Martin was killed? Why was there no unrest there? Why was there no unrest in Staten Island? Have you guys heard of Eric Garner? He was, like, selling loose cigarettes on the street in Staten Island. Uh, the guy, you could hear him saying, I can't breathe, when the cop choked him out and killed him. But nothing happened really in Staten Island. There were peaceful protests. Totally different from what happened in Ferguson. So 
I was watching from New York City, you know, like many people around the country, watching 2, 3 in the morning, and just feeling powerless because St. Louis was my hometown. And, uh, and so I, the next week I went home and I started, I just went out there every day and started interviewing people. Uh, I had served in the Missouri Senate from 2006 to 2009, and I had grown up in a in a neighborhood about five minutes south of first. I played, I don't know what I did, but I played basketball my whole life <laughs> and coached basketball uh, for over a decade in neighborhoods adjacent to Ferguson. And so uh, I went home and even a couple weeks after Mike Brown was killed, the anger was still palpable on the street. I understood it though, because the whole time that I'd grown up in St. Louis, it had always felt like it was simmering. Let me explain. Uh, I grew up in a town called Olivet. Here's, St. Louis, here's the city. And that big white area is the city, and everything else is St. Louis County. Okay, St. Louis City, the, in St. Louis City, the public schools uh, were approximately 90% black. In St. Louis County, there were 23 suburban school districts, and most of them were about 90% white overwhelmingly white. And so, uh, in 1972, a woman who was living in the city named Minnie Liddell, she got tired of the fact that her son was being uh, basically moved from inferior school to, to even worse school year after year, and she sued. One woman decided to sue. And 10 years later, after that case went all the way through the system, a federal judge found that the whole St. Louis metropolitan area was complicit in this basically separate but equal school system that characterized St. Louis, whereby kids growing up here, 90% of them went to all black schools, and then kids growing up throughout St. Louis County almost all went to more affluent white schools. So the solution that the federal judge decreed was that any kid, any black kid who lived in St. Louis City could get on a bus and go out to the county. Okay? It was, it was the largest, the country's largest voluntary school desegregation program uh, in history. And uh, started in St. Louis. And um, I, it, uh, it, it kind of had a profound effect on my life uh, in a lot of ways. Let me kind of back up and explain why. Um, my, my grandfather had been a professional athlete, and uh, my dad had these dreams that I was going to be an NBA player, uh, which I, I know is funny. Um, but he took me to the doctor when I was like three. My parents took me to the doctor and said, hey, is, uh, is he in good health? And the doctor's like, yeah, he's in good health, but you should know he's in the third percentile in both height and weight. My mom was like, well, honey, at least he's not in the first or the second percentile. And the doctor was like, well, actually, there's no such thing. We cut it off at three so people don't feel too bad. Um, anyway, the point is, my dad just had this dream that I was going to play pro basketball. So he would, he would drop me off in the city when I was seven, eight, nine years old and drop me off the playgrounds, and that's how I learned how to play basketball. By my senior year at my high school, which would have been about a 90% white high school, but was about 30% black uh, because of kids who came out from the city. Um, my, uh, I was the only guy who lived in my district on my basketball team. And so those were my closest friends, uh, my teammates. We had a good team, we went all the way to the state tournament. And one of the things that I learned about the sort of inequalities in St. Louis that I still remember to this day was my co-captain on the team said to me, he said, you think I'm dumb because I'm in the low track in all the classes, don't you? I was like, no, I don't think you're dumb. He's like, yeah, you do. Everybody around here thinks I'm stupid. They think we're all stupid, all the city kids. It bothered me to hear him say it, but I knew he was right because I knew how most of the white kids felt. And he said, what they don't understand, what nobody around here understands is when I came out here my freshman year, what you guys were doing was like three or four years ahead of anything that I had done before. And nobody realized that. And that kind of stayed with me for a long time. So when I came back 
after Ferguson, the first thing I did was call a bunch of my old high school teammates, many of whom I hadn't seen in a decade. Uh, most of them, unfortunately, were working in kind of dead-end jobs, most of them making just a low hourly wage. Uh, and just like 25 years earlier, they avoided driving through Ferguson. I remembered when one, two of my teammates used to stay with me during the week. If they didn't stay at a house in the suburbs, they'd have to wake up in the city at about 4.45 to get to the first bus stop at about 5.45 to get out to school by 7.30. And then school would end at 3 o'clock, especially if we had a game that night, especially an away game. Then they'd be at school, we'd go to the away game, we'd sit through the junior varsity game, our game would finish at about 9.30, bus would get us back to school at about 10.15, and then their bus would get them back to their house around midnight. So then they had four hours, 45 minutes to shower, sleep, and do all their homework and eat breakfast. So a couple of them stayed with me a lot. And they would always tell me that they would take like these ridiculous detours so that they wouldn't have to drive through a couple of these towns in North St. Louis County, one of them which was Ferguson. And I honestly thought, you know, they were probably exaggerating. It couldn't be that bad. Uh, so was it that bad? Well, we learned a lot a year and a half ago. Uh, and I learned a lot uh, later on. That was when I was about 18, when I was in high school. When I came back to St. Louis after college, I was in graduate school, and I worked as a delivery man. I delivered vanilla extract to about 120 grocery stores every morning. And I was always late. And I was always rushing to get one more store. So I was always speeding. And what that meant was I got pulled over constantly. And one thing I found when I got pulled over, whenever I was in North St. Louis County, which is the part of St. Louis County that's predominantly black, um, I would go to traffic court and uh, and really, this wasn't true in just in North St. Louis County. It was true all over St. Louis County. And I'd go to traffic court, and there'd be a white prosecutor. There'd be a white de public defender. There'd be a white city clerk taking your money. There'd be a white judge. And there'd be 100 black people lined up to go pay off their fines. Only I ever saw another white person in any of these traffic courts. Why did I go to the traffic courts? I went there because, and I'm kind of ashamed to admit this, one of my lawyer friends told me, hey, look, you should always go to the traffic court. Put a nice shirt on, put nice khakis on, and just go apologize to the judge and watch what happens. And I did. And about half the time, the judge would say, and I, and I, and I would say, Your Honor, I'm working on my PhD, and I have a part-time job delivering vanilla, and I know I, I was going too fast, and I'm sorry. I just wanted to, to make sure that I could get back to my classes in time. And at least half the time, he would say, you know what, dismissed. I never saw that happen to anyone else uh, in those chapter courts. And so when I watched what was happening uh, after Ferguson, I understood a little bit of the roots of people's anger. Now let me explain it from a slightly different perspective. In St. Louis County, there are 90 different towns in a county of a million people. 90 towns, 63 different fire departments, 64 different police departments in a county of 1 million people, and 80 different traffic courts. Does that make sense to have 63 different fire? And you know how expensive it is to have a fire truck, to have a whole public safety apparatus? It makes absolutely no sense. <coughs> Why are there so many towns? Anyone have a guess why there's so many towns? Well, as you've seen in the news, and as I've just described, St. Louis has a little bit of a problem with race. And the dominant reason that most of these towns formed was so that they could have their own zoning and essentially write into law ordinances which forbade affordable housing or forbade multifamily housing. Basically, zoning that would ensure 
that African Americans moving out from the city could not live in that town. That was, that's the history of the formation of many of the towns in North St. Louis County. And after a while, it became incredibly inefficient for a town. There's one town that has 14 people in it. And it's got its own police force. There's many towns, there's many towns that have less than a thousand people, three, four, five, six hundred, that have their own police force and fire department. Now, as you might imagine, in an area where the tax base is declining, stores have, have left, and property values have stagnated. They really need revenue to support a whole public safety apparatus, to support a whole fire department and police department, but they don't have the money to do that. And so what do they do? What do these towns do to get the money? Well, they're towns that for the most part, again, are dominated, the power structure is overwhelmingly white, but now the people who live in the towns are overwhelmingly black. And so they basically made quiet decisions over the course of the last couple decades that, well, here's how we'll raise revenue. We'll, we'll pull people over. One of the things that I learned when I served in the Senate Many of my constituents would call me uh, unemployed. And many of them were unemployed, or they would call me because they had family members who were incarcerated in one of these towns. Because in one of these towns, if you got pulled over, you usually didn't get a ticket for speeding. You usually got a ticket for speeding, a ticket for not wearing your seatbelt, a ticket for failure to show proof of insurance, a ticket for an outdated license plate, a ticket for a broken taillight. So then you have five tickets and you owe $860 plus court fees. And most people who are struggling can't just write an eight, nine, hundred dollar check immediately. And so what would happen? Well, they'd end up in the county jail. Or they'd end up in this little town jail with 10 other people. The problem is they wouldn't get a phone, you know, they get a phone call to a lawyer, they might call a family member and explain what had happened. The family member might go to a payday loan place, get 300 bucks, but couldn't get the whole amount. And so somebody would be in prison for two weeks, three weeks. And then what would happen while they were in prison? Well, there's only so long that you can call in sick before you get fired from a job. And so uh, many of my constituents, this was their fate. This was how they lost jobs. This was how they got involved in the criminal justice system and got a record. And that, more than anything, uh, was the source, I believe, in talking, interviewing hundreds of people on the front lines in Ferguson of a lot of the anger that I saw. So was Mike Brown, was his death the breaking point? Absolutely. But did it just come out of nowhere? Absolutely not. It was the product of decades of simmering anger. Uh, simmering anger that was not the only way in which criminal justice policy offered perverse incentives for law enforcement to essentially suck the wealth <coughs> from citizens. Uh, there was another way that public policy did this that I learned about when I was in the Senate. And this was, um, it was a little bit similar. My signature event, when I was in the Senate, I would put on a three-on-three -three basketball tournament. And in my second year of doing it, a bunch of guys who were playing in the tournament came up to me and told me that they were in prison because they couldn't pay child support. I don't know how much you guys have read about like our Constitution and kind of the traditions of America, but one of our sort of, you know, things that sort of always, th that differentiated America from places in the old world, was that we didn't have debtor's prison in this country. If you were poor, you maybe couldn't afford nice things, but you didn't get locked up because of it. Well, Missouri and many other states, actually, you can. These guys would come up to me at my basketball tournament and tell me that uh, <coughs> they had gotten locked up because they owed child support. and. Most of them had had decent jobs at one point. St. Louis, like a lot of places in 
in parts of Minnesota and throughout the, the Rust Belt and the Midwest, used to be a manufacturing hub. St. Louis was the second biggest auto manufacturing place in the country. So a lot of these guys had jobs on the assembly line where they were making 40, 50, 60,000 bucks. Then they would, in many cases, get a divorce. They had to pay child support. Their child support payments, while they were making $50,000 a year, were like, you know, 10, 15,000 bucks a year, 1,000 bucks a month or so. Once they lost those jobs when the car manufacturing, when the auto assembly lines closed, then they were only making more like $15,000 a year. When you're making $15,000 a year, you can't pay $12,000 a year of child support. So these guys would go and try to modify their child support order. You know what the average time was in St. Louis to get your child support order modified when I looked into it back in 2008? Two years and 11 months. The problem was that the statute the criminal statute which governed that said that if you missed any six months of payments, you didn't make full payments for any six months in any 12-month period, you could be prosecuted, convicted of a felony, and sent to prison. So here you've got all these guys losing a job, getting a much lower paying job, trying to get their support order modified, but they can't do it quickly enough. And then they end up getting locked up because they missed some payments within a year. I'll tell you, there's one place they definitely can't pay child support from. You know where it is? Right? Prison. So this inspired me to write a bill that dealt with it. And the legislation basically did two things. It said instead of getting a felony conviction, you'll get a misdemeanor. And instead of going to prison, you'll get a chance to have basically wraparound services to help you get back on your feet. If you need parenting classes, you could get them. If you need vocational training, you could get trained in plumbing or carpentry or some other apprenticeship. If you needed substance abuse counseling, you could get that too. The key was you stayed out of prison. Uh, and you didn't get a record where you'd have to tell every prospective employer after that that you had a felony conviction. When I first filed this bill in the Senate, the Senate was 26 Republicans and 8 Democrats. And one of my Republican colleagues joked that it was the who's your daddy bill. It was laughed at. But then I found a bunch of guys who had called my office on this issue and I brought them to the state capitol. Because I figured they could tell their story a lot better than I could tell their story. And they testified in front of the Senate and House committees and the bill ultimately passed 144 to 1 in the House and 33 to 0 in the Senate. And it became law. And I was really proud. And so I stood up on the steps of the federal courthouse in, in St. Louis with about 50 of these guys behind me who had been incarcerated for this. And we announced that the governor had signed the bill and that many men could be helped in the future. And never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that six months later, I would be locked up myself. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about prison. I went to prison in Southeast Kentucky. Uh, any of you ever seen the movie Deliverance? Probably not. Have you seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Okay. So I was in a place uh, in, in Appalachia, you know, with the very southeast tip of, uh, of Kentucky. I got to the, to the intake center, the gates clanged shut behind me, and a heavy set nurse looked at me, she said, uh, hot and white? I said, 5'6", 117. She kind of smirked. Education level? PhD. Last profession? State senator. She said, all right. If you want to play games, you can play games all you want. We got ones here who think they're Jesus Christ, so you'll fit right in. <laughs> and then she sent me to three COs, guards. And one of them kind of barked at me. All right, screw it. And I did. Turn around, he said. And I did. Let me see your wallet. Uh, 
thought we weren't supposed to bring our wallet in. Your prison wallet. Excuse me? Open up your damn butt cheeks. <laughs> and that was my introduction to federal prison. So let me talk a little bit about the ways that prison itself, that our prisons constitute a perverse incentive. In other words, they, uh, and you guys have had some great lectures as part of this series about the prison industrial complex and about mass incarceration, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it from a, maybe a more personal angle. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the economics of prison. And basically I'm going to tell you three different ways that prison, instead of rehabilitating people, actually reinforces and fosters recidivism. <coughs> so, makes people more likely to reoffend when they come out, uh, which results in our nation not just having the highest incarceration rate of any nation in the history of the world, but the highest recidivism rate too. 77%, more than three out of every four people who come out of prison end up back in prison within five years. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, give, explain about three different reasons why. So the first reason is because prison reinforces people's tendency to operate outside the mainstream economy, okay? outside kind of the rules. Um, so my, uh, about a week in, about a week into my um, prison bid, I got called down to the administration building. That's me as a senator um, in my better days. And uh, I get called down to the prison administration building by this guy who's the captain. If prison were a private school, like the captain would be the dean of discipline. Okay? And he calls me down and he says, uh, inmates, come in. If I wanted to know something about politics, you think it'd be better if I popped off like I knew something? Or if I consulted with an expert such as yourself? Probably be better to ask someone. He says, huh. And if you want to know something about prison, you think it'd be better to come up in here like you knew everything? Or to maybe ask somebody who knew what they were doing? Probably be better to ask someone. He said, well, that's real funny, inmate, because you ain't even been here a week yet, and you's already in here breaking prison rules. Sir, I don't know what you're referring to. He says, oh, I think you know exactly what I'm referring to. You's in here conducting a business right out the prison. Don't know what you mean, sir. He says, oh, you're going to write yourself a big book and get rich, ain't you? Because early on, I had started jotting down notes on toilet paper and napkins, the notes which be which ultimately became this book. And I said, uh, sir, I'm not running a business out of the prison. I'm not going to make a penny off anything while I'm incarcerated. And I read the prison handbook. And my interpretation was that it's definitely prohibited to run a tattoo parlor out of your cell, or to sell pornography, or to be a bookie, or to smuggle contraband. But that jotting down notes on toilet paper doesn't really break any of the rules. He said, ah, oh, I see, inmate. Is that your interpretation? Huh. Well, I got some good news for you. This ain't no Senate here, and this ain't no Supreme Court. And if I think he's conducting the business, he's probably conducting the business. And if he ain't, we'll throw you in the shoe for six months while we figure it out. You know what the shoe is? Solitary confinement. It's not a place you ever want to be. I saw a lot of guys come out of solitary confinement, and they walked with something which was called on the compound the Thorazine Shuffle. They walked sort of like this. They'd been drugged so relentlessly and sedated so much while they were in solitary, they came out as shells of human beings. Uh, about an hour after that conversation with the captain, I got my work assignment for the year. He put me in the warehouse on, the, on a loading dock hauling all the food that came into the compound. So, <laughs> I'm the one in the middle. <laughs> and that was actually about 40 pounds ago. 
for me. So you can uh, imagine how much bigger those guys were. Uh, we moved about 40,000 pounds of food every day. We moved meat in 60 and 80 pound boxes. All the rice, the beans, the flour, and the sugar came in 100 pound bags. And you can imagine uh, how much fun it was at 117 pounds when I came in to throw and catch 100 pound bags, uh, which those guys, uh, which was very entertaining for, for my colleagues there. Um, why so much food? Why 40,000 pounds of food every day? Uh, well, you know, there were about 2,500 people on the yard, but the prison has to keep a couple weeks worth of food on hand all the time because of, uh, anyone know? Lockdowns. Sometimes you have a lockdown and no one can come in or out uh, of the prison border. And so they have to keep a lot of extra food. So basically, we spent 40 hours a week in freezers that were bigger than this room. And every time the food comes in, you had to first go to the back of the freezer. First you had to take the food out of the front of the freezer and take it out of the freezer. Then you had to take the food from the back of the freezer and put it in the front of the freezer. And then you had to take the new food and put it in the back of the freezer. And one thing I noticed my first week was that all the food we were taking out of the back of the freezer had expiration dates of like 2004. This was 2010. And most of it said, for institutional use only. And what that means, like in case you're wondering, it means you're probably not getting the best parts of that cow. Uh, the CO joked with us that we were really lucky because a few months before that, all of the fish had said, not for human consumption. And what that told us was that, I mean, it wasn't like we thought we deserved filet mignon, but it reminded us that in the eyes of the criminal justice system, we weren't quite animals, but we weren't quite human either. So let me get to some of my main takeaways, the ways in which prison uh, for, you know, fosters recidivism. So this first way involves my job at the warehouse. Uh, prison is not what people think it is in terms of money. Most people think, hey, once you're in prison, you got to make it. You get three hops and a cop, right? It may suck, but at least, like, you got everything taken care of for you, don't you? Well, that's a common misconception, because in reality, as you guys learned about, didn't you have a lecture on asset forfeiture? <laughs> Most guys who come in, I was locked up with 99% drug dealers. About two-thirds of the guys are in for crack, about a third were in for meth or oxy. And almost all of them had their entire bank accounts cleaned out. Any one of their family members who could have been shown to have been part of the conspiracy had their bank accounts swept out. So everybody's basically broke. And you've got to find a way to buy everything. You want soap? You want deodorant? You want a toothbrush or toothpaste? Well, you got to buy it yourself. And you get crappy products marked up about 50% over what you pay at CVS. The problem is that for that job, I was making $5.25, which some people say, that's not that bad, but that's $5.25 a month. So your hourly, my hourly salary was about two and a half cents or something. Now, I was lucky. I wasn't like most people in the prison. I had some savings. I'm not a rich man, but I had enough that people could send me 100 bucks a month to have peanut butter, to have you know, the necessities from the canteen, and to have decent hygiene. But most people were not that fortunate. And so what most people developed were hustles, ways to figure out how to make money inside the prison, which is not easy. My first day at the warehouse, the CO in charge told us, I will take care of you, you will eat good, but don't ever let me catch any of you stealing. And I watched at the end of that first day, and, and both basically, Everybody went on like a shopping spree at the end of the day and stuffed it all into their freezer jacket or you know, used other mechanisms. And after about a week, I mean, I wasn't going to steal. Right? My, you know, my parents, in no uncertain terms, said, OK, like, you effed up bad, but don't you dare do anything wrong while you're in there. 
Uh, and I think, uh, it, it was good advice. But then a week in, another guy at the warehouse told me, not one of these guys, a diff different guy, said to me, look, a couple of these guys, they're going to plant raw meat in your freezer jacket and frame you. And I'm like, what? Like, raw meat so my freezer jacket smells? They're like, no. Raw meat, stealing it, is, is, is about the most trouble you can get in in prison. It's akin, on a discipline level, it's akin to inciting a riot in a prison. Why? Bodybuilding is sort of the central, a central feature of prison culture. Everybody's lifting all the time and trying to get big. And what do you need to be able to get big besides lifting weights? Protein. And one of the only sources of protein is meat, which is ser served in very, very small amounts at the cafeteria. And so if you can steal raw meat, it's extremely valuable back on the yard to sell it. And so they were going to put that in my freezer jacket. Why do you think they were going to do that to me? Any, can anyone guess? Because I was the only one not stealing. And they thought I was about to wrap them up. Make sense? So that day, I waited for the CO to uh, take a smoking break. And then I quietly saran wrapped four green peppers to my chest, put my stuff back on, stuffed bananas in my socks, and put my pants back over my boots, walked back to the yard, and got out of the bus, walked up to the unit, and I was like, hey, y'all. <laughs> and the dude on the far right, I'll never forget it, he's like, damn, the Senate would be embezzling. <laughs> Now, that taught me about how to stay safe in prison, that lesson, how to, how to stay safe and take care of myself. Because the last thing I wanted was to get caught with raw meat. To get caught with raw meat, I could have gotten five more years in a maximum security, which I did not want. So it taught me about how to take care of myself and protect myself. But it also taught me about a much more fundamental trait, I think, of prison life, which is ingenuity incredible entrepreneurial ingenuity that all these guys had. They had all developed incredible hustles to be able to get by. There was one guy named BJ, whose cell was next door to mine. He was from Detroit. He had figured out a way to merge his two passions into one entrepreneurial vision. And he had deputized his 19-year-old son to purchase a website on the outside that exclusively featured beautiful redheads having sex on top of classic luxury cars. He had appointed his son, 19 years old, vice president for talent development. And his son, every week, was sending in pictures of women who he was auditioning. And this guy was running a very, very lucrative pornography website from inside the prison. Now, I tell that story because it's kind of humorous. But it's indicative of the type of ingenuity that I saw. Guys in prison had all types of hustles, ranging from the totally legal, like guys who were artistic, they were talented, and so they would draw portraits of another guy's wife or daughter or mother to be sent home on a birthday or Mother's Day. Other guys would contract to write poetry to, to dudes who thought that their girl was leaving them or hadn't visited in a couple of years. Then there were somewhat less legal hustles, like guys who were bookies who made book on all the prison basketball games. Then even less legal hustles, like the guys who ran tattoo parlors out of their cell. And then the most illegal hustles, which were the guys who smuggled in drugs or pornography or steroids or cell phones. So it really ranged the whole gamut. But I gotta tell you, prison was teeming with guys whose entrepreneurial instincts were sharper than those of the CEOs who had wined and dined me when I was in the Senate. In fact, there wasn't a single concept that you would learn at Wharton or Harvard Business School that you couldn't learn inside prison. New product launch, or quality control, or territorial expansion, or supply chain management. Every one of these concepts, they 
totally understood it, and they would explain it to you. Not in the business school parlance, but in the parlance of the drug trade. Unfortunately, there was absolutely no training to help any of these guys translate their intuitive grasp of business concepts into any legitimate enterprise. In fact, there were only three courses offered the whole year I was in prison. One was a GED course that lasted about two weeks. They told another prisoner to teach it and didn't give him any materials, just said, hey, teach these guys how to read and do math so they can pass the GED. That was basically a disaster. Then they offered a hydroponics course. Do you know what hydroponics is? What is it? Anyone know? Growing plants in water. Growing plants in water. Because what could better prepare you for a successful reentry than knowing how to grow plants in water, right? So for two weeks, this CEO showed these guys how to grow tomatoes in water. And we understood what that was all about. At the end of those two weeks, when the CEO told all the guys to box up the tomatoes and put them in the trunk of his car, which presumably then he or one of his family members sold on the side of the road. The final course that we were offered to prepare us for successful reentry was a computer course. And there was an acute need for that. Because most of the guys I was locked up with in 2010 had never used a computer. Right? Personal computers weren't really ubiquitous till the 90s. And a lot of these guys had 17 years. 10 years from the mandatory minimum for drugs, five years because there was a gun on their case. So 15 plus sometimes sentencing enhance enhancements for selling drugs near a school or a park or something else. So a lot of these guys had no clue what, how to use a computer. There were 12 brand new computers at the prison in a room that sat there fallow, totally unused for the whole year. And at the end of the year, the, C the CO, they called us down and they sat us down at these 12 computers. They told us to sign in. We all signed in our name and our number on this sheet that said, pre-release course, computer skills. CO looks at us, he's like, all right. See the little button on the bottom right? Push that little button in, that's gonna turn your computer on. Okay. We all do that. Silence for about 60 seconds. Then one of the prisoners, it's like playing with a mouse. And he's like, yo, CO, when you move this, shut the fuck up. Okay. Sat there for about 40 more minutes in silence. And the CO says, y'all remember that little button on the bottom right? Push it again. And then get the fuck out of here. But, since we'd all signed in on that sheet of paper, the prison could then send that to the Bureau of Prisons in Washington and receive a small stipend for each one of us who had successfully completed our computer skills course. Crazy, isn't it? Look, upon release, 650,000 people come back to the doorsteps of our communities every year. The same communities where they've already failed once before. Only now they've got the added stigma of a prison record. And guess what? Three quarters of them are going to reoffend. The main reason is because they don't need money. Because they can't get a job. Prison education could change this. If we wanted to create a different type of incentive, we could. You know what the recidivism rate in Denmark is? It's like 11%. Okay, so it's about one-seventh of our recidivism rate. Germany, Norway, Sweden, all of those countries have recidivism rates in the teens. Okay, if we wanted to operate our prisons differently, like they do, we could. When you go to prison in Germany, as you might have seen if you saw a feature on this on 60 Minutes two weeks ago, the first thing they do is not give you greens or orange clothes. You Go around in your street clothes. They don't give you a number because they don't want to dehumanize you. They call you by your name. And then, most importantly, they ascertain what skills you have. And they do their best over the three or five or seven years you'll be there to align your natural abilities with needs of employers in the communities to which you'll return. 
so that you can come out and actually be successful. And that's why their crime rate is much lower than ours is, and public safety is enhanced relative to the United States. But only when society stops thinking of prisoners as our throwaways and totally unworthy of any small investment will we ever be, will we ever accomplish that in the way that those countries have. The second way that prison perversely fosters recidivism is that it reduces people's ability to be in touch with their loved ones. We know there's two things that can actually, that social science tells us, reduce recidivism. The first one is when prisoners advance educationally while they're incarcerated. The, the RAM Corporation did a study and it showed that prisoners who advance educationally are 43% less likely to reoffend. Okay? The second thing we know is that prisoners who stay in touch with their family, their friends, and their pastor are less likely to reoffend. And so, what did we do for, for the last few decades in this country? Well, we put in phone, we let private phone companies come into our prisons and charge as much as $14 a minute for phone calls. Where I was, it was about a buck fifty to two dollars a minute to call home. Think about that. You're making five dollars twenty-five cents a month. You gotta buy toothpaste and soap, and then you gotta figure out how to save, how to set two dollars aside so you could have a one-minute phone call with your kids every month. It's crazy, isn't it? And yet, you know, firms are continuing, are profiting really off the most vulnerable people in society. Why doesn't it change? Well, prisoners are some of our most politically feeble people. They can't vote, okay? And what's more, prisoners are taken away, usually from urban places, and put into prison in rural <coughs> places. So they're, they're not allowed to vote, but their bodies are counted for legislative apportionment reasons. So when every state is determining how many state legislators, how many state reps, or how many state senators each part of the state will get, rural counties that are typically electing very conservative legislators who want prisons because they're jobs, because they provide jobs, they get empowered politically because of the apportionment scheme that award, that counts those bodies in the rural place where they're incarcerated, even though the people cannot vote. It's like a modern day three-fifths compromise, except it's zero-fifths. When you think about all this, perhaps the system isn't broken, as people say. Maybe the system's working exactly as it was supposed to. The final way that prison fosters recidivism is a way that nobody really likes to talk about. It's taboo. And that's great. We lament the fact that on our college campuses, we tolerate something like, you know, that people call a rape culture. And it does exist on some campuses, not all. But you know there's more rapes that happen every year in this country in prison than the total number of rapes that happen outside of prison? It's appalling. And not only do we tolerate it as a society, we tolerate it by saying, hey, whatever you did to get to prison, whatever it was, you're in prison now. And so whatever happens to you, you probably deserve it. That's how we look at things. And in fact, it's kind of a useful, it's kind of a useful deterrent, I think, is the way that most people in the system look at it. If I ask every man in this crowd tonight, what do you really fear more than anything in the world? <coughs> Do you think you might say going to prison and getting raped? I think a lot of guys would. And so we use that as a, as a deterrent, but we don't just tolerate that. We actually laugh at it. You ever watch CSI or Law and & Order, and at the end when the prosecutor like convicts the perp, and the guy's walking out of the courtroom and he says, don't drop the soap, you know, we think it's funny. It's actually really short-sighted of us to laugh at that. Because in way too many cases, the same guy 
who gets raped in prison, comes back and tragically attempts to reclaim his manhood in the same way he perceives it was stolen from him in prison which makes everyone in society, men, women, children, a lot less safe. But you know, in prison, I didn't see rape, any rapes. I heard about some. What I actually did see at one point was true intimacy. There were these two guys, Porkchop and JT. <laughs> and one night I was up in my, uh, in my bed, and I could see down, and another guy was walking down the corridor, and he saw these two guys snuggling in bed together. And he started to smirk and laugh. And then one of the veterans looked at him and said, it ain't none of your mother in business. And it wasn't. Look, prison culture scars. Okay? It scars people. It causes you to develop a tough veneer and refuse to express any emotion, because expressing any emotion is weakness. It gives you a general anxiety rooted in fear of being exploited by guards or other prisoners. And it gives you a tendency to react to small slights, like someone cutting in line, but you can't let that happen. And so you shank them, or you, try to, or you hit them, or you try to fight them. And all the behaviors that you develop in prison as survival mechanisms make you totally dysfunctional back on the street. Anyone who's ever been locked up knows how dehumanizing prison can be. And yet, whether it was the entrepreneurial ingenuity I saw from the guys hustling, or whether it was the inquisitiveness and curiosity of the guys I tutored for GEDs, or whether it was JT and Porkchop, cuddling at night. Guys who had been locked up for 20 years and just needed the human touch. What I found was that the human spirit triumphed even in the face of a totally dehumanizing place where the system and individual COs at every turn were doing everything they could to take away people's humanity. And that should remind all of us not to write off 2.2 million people like so much trash. Look, when I came out of prison, I had every advantage. I had a PhD from a top university. I had community support. 300 people wrote letters to the judge asking for clemency in my case so that I wouldn't have to go to prison. I had family support. I had savings. I wasn't in prison long enough to suffer any deep psychological or physical trauma. I'm white. In every way, I had it better coming out than just about everybody I was locked up with. And you know what? I had a hard time finding a decent job when I came out. I remember my first interview. I interviewed with an organization that fights for affordable housing in Missouri. I sat with their board. They asked me a whole round of questions. And then the vice chair of the board said to me, look, it's clear from the last hour that you know how to raise money. You understand this policy. You know how to build a grassroots organization, and you're well-connected in Jefferson City, the state capital. You'd probably be great. But here's my question. Why shouldn't we let some other organization hire you, and then we could hire you away from them in six months or nine months, after the stench has kind of faded a little bit? Ninety percent of all jobs in this country, perform, employers perform criminal background checks. 85% of all landlords perform criminal background checks and refuse to hire or rent to anyone coming out of prison. It shouldn't surprise us that three out of four people reoffend. If anything, it should surprise us that one out of four manage not to. And until we all have a totally different mindset, until we start thinking when we see people in prison or we watch Oz, or Shawshank or anything else, that could be my brother. That could be my dad. That could be me. We won't treat prisoners with the humanity that will enable them to come out whole. And we'll continue providing these perverse disincentives that cause COs to say what the CO said 
to almost everyone who walked out of that prison. He'd say, we'll see you in six months, jackass. Guys like you remind me I'm always going to have a job. What if we totally turn that on its face and we said that every prisoner who leaves gets trapped and for every six months or 12 months that they stay clean, the COs who guarded them get a thousand dollar bonus every six months. What if we provided a smart incentive for COs and wardens to lift up people in prison so they could succeed on the outside instead of providing them an incentive to tear them down and probably ensure that they'll be back. Thanks very much. So you know what I told my aides? I said, look, I want to know what you guys did. They're like, so should we give them the voting information, the attendance record? I'm like, did you hear what I said? Just don't tell me anything. I don't want to know what you did, OK? And then I didn't think about it. Two weeks later, about a week before election day, I figured that that postcard was never going to happen. So I called a press conference. And with TV cameras in front of me, I said, Russ Carnahan, my opponent, who's a nice and decent man from a wonderful family with a proud tradition of public service, doesn't show up for work. So we shouldn't elect him to Congress. He doesn't deserve a promotion because he didn't go to work as a state legislator. The next day, this postcard comes out. It says the same things that I had just said in the press conference, only it has a phony disclaimer. You know that disclaimer at the bottom of a piece of political mail? Paid for by Franken for US Senate. Whatever. It has a phony disclaimer. So Cardigan, my opponent, files a complaint with the Federal Election Commission saying that, uh, alleging that there was illegal coordination between my campaign and whoever put out that postcard. I lose the campaign by about 1%. A week after the campaign, my lawyer prepares an affidavit. It's got 15 statements. 14 of them are true. That's not good enough for the fact. The 15th one said, I had no advanced knowledge of anything about that postcard. I rationalized it in my mind. I said, I didn't have advanced knowledge because I told them not to tell me anything. So I signed. I had made a pact with these aides of mine that none of us would ever breathe a word about this. Or all of us would get in trouble. And so I signed the affidavit denied. Five years later, when I was in the Senate, 
my best friend called me, and he said, the feds just picked up Skip, that practitioner of the political dark arts. They just picked up Skip, and the feds have him for spousal abuse, illegal weapons possession, cocaine distribution, heroin distribution, mortgage fraud, bank fraud, wire fraud, and now he's the chief suspect in a car bombing that nearly killed his ex-wife's divorce lawyer. <laughs> I wanted to win that first campaign so badly that I let my aides deal with this monster of a guy. So my best friend says, we gotta talk about this, man. What if the feds pick him up? We got to sit down. I'm like, okay. So he comes to my house and we go back and forth and my best friend says, what are you going to do with the feds guy? I said, look, I already signed an affidavit five years ago. And I agreed with my two aides none of us would ever say anything. So I'm going to stick to my story. Because if I tell the truth now that I knew something, then they could get me on signing a false affidavit five years ago. So for two months, my best friend and I went back and forth. Little did I know that entire time he was wearing a wire. So then the feds basically, they were interested in the mayor of St. Louis, or the attorney general, or the US senator, or a congressman, all people higher on the food chain, that they would have liked to see me rat out or wear a wire on. And most of these people were friends of mine who I didn't think were doing anything wrong. So I didn't want to help the feds on what I perceived to be kind of a fishing expedition. And so I didn't wear a wire, and so I got a year and a day. You guys already learned about overzealous prosecutors, right? <laughs> the prosecutor, the day of the, my guilty plea, he said, this is a textbook case of the most venal type of political corruption. Because I signed a false affidavit and lied about whether or not I knew my aides met with someone who put out a postcard that had factual information about my opponent's intention. I made a big mistake. But it was not a classic case of political corruption. It was really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question, Michelle. Other questions? Ma'am? prisons that were similarly cruel and inhumane, and they seem to have progressed a great deal in most of Europe. Uh, why haven't we been able to do the same? It's a very good question. I think there's a very deep vein of vengeance that runs through many Americans. Uh, many Americans want punishment. They want retribution for people who commit crimes, especially certain types of crimes. Um, and I think that it is probably a deeper uh, kind of vein within the American sort of collective psyche than in other places. Um, we say we're a culture of second chances, and yet most employers freely admit they'd never hire someone who went to prison in taking private surveys, uh, confidential surveys about it. So we say one thing on Sunday morning in church, and then we act a very different way uh, when we're actually conducting ourselves. And politicians have exploited that. And over the course, especially in the 80s and 90s, bringing back chain gangs and having meaner and just cheaper and meaner prisons uh, throughout the country, especially in the Sun Belt, less so in Minnesota, where I met uh, yesterday, last night, I met the head of correctional education in Minnesota. And Minnesota, which has, you know, which people here date their ancestry to Finland and Norway and, you know, uh, a lot of Scandinavia and, and the places that have the most humane correctional systems right now. And Minnesota's is probably marginally better than those in most other states. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should reopen Appleton, you know, in my opinion. Um, so I just, I think that the, 
it's a long answer to, to a short question. Um, and I think it's just, you know, we still have, look at guns in this country. You know, like, the cops don't even have guns in a lot of these European countries. In Australia, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, they just decided, you know what, like, we're tired of having people walk into schools and kill our, ki our children, or walk into public malls and kill people, so we're just going to get everybody's gun. And people were mad for a while, they said, we've got a frontier culture, and then they got over it. And now gun ownership is extremely limited in Australia. You know, we could do things here on these issues, uh, but it is so deeply ingrained. This, I think there's a deeply ingrained culture of, uh, of the frontier and of violence and of retribution, the, the notion of retribution in our country and we'll need to, my book, the number one reason I wrote my book, prisoners in my book aren't angels. I write about the good and the bad and the ugly. But my goal is to humanize people who are incarcerated. Because until we think of them as humans, people who, who could be one of us. And increasingly that's the case. Because with mass incarceration increasingly, people know somebody in prison. And uh, until we get there to where we you know, have, have humanize people who are incarcerated in the way they have in, in other countries, you know, that to me is the first step to fixing the problem. And right now, too many of us think of anyone in prison as the other. Good question. Probably an insufficient answer. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Michael. So after your experience with like coordinating with Third party. Uh -huh. um, would you say that kind of changed your mind as to how you do politics and like how dark money plays like, politics? Dark money plays a role in politics. It's a great question. Michael, obviously, are you a political science major? Minor. Minor. Okay. So um, you seem to know a little bit about campaigns and how they operate, which is great. Uh, since I ran, the campaign finance laws have been loosened dramatically by a couple big Supreme Court decisions. One is called Free Speech Now, the other is Citizens United. You might have heard of those, especially the latter. And so basically, no one gets prosecuted for doing what I, I, I'm the only person, I think, in the history of the country that's gone to prison with campaign coordination as the underlying crime. Uh, I'm not crying about it. Like, I did a crime, so I did a time. But, it hasn't changed my perspective on our campaign finance laws. I mean, I think you can only have two campaign finance regimes that will work. The first is unlimited contributions all, anywhere all the time, totally transparent, every dollar down to the cent must be reported within 24 hours online so everyone can see everything. Or, what I prefer, public financing of campaigns, which would mean that, like, in order to run for office, if you're a working class person, you can still be a successful candidate for office. You don't need to be rich or know a bunch of rich people. You need to get a thousand people to commit to giving you five dollars. And if you get a thousand people to commit to giving you five dollars each, then a state would kick in three hundred thousand dollars or whatever you need, like up to some sort of threat to some ceiling. So anybody who can show that they actually have widespread grassroots support. And I put, you put something like that in place to make sure that like, any crank can't just go get a half million dollars in state money to rent TV ads. But if you put some threshold like that in, you could basically have a somewhat level playing field where you know, a working class person could have just as good of a chance as the son of a governor and a US senator. So that's what I always kind of preferred. Uh, clearly what my experience, I'm sure, you know, made me think a lot about. You know, I mean, obviously, not obviously, but like, it's hard. It's hard to watch subsequently Sheldon Adelson, a billionaire who owns the Sands Casinos in Las Vegas. He's worth like 20 or 30 billion dollars. And he wrote a check last election cycle to Newt Gingrich's independent super PAC for 16 million dollars. And then they had a meeting and the press found out about it. And they walked out of the meeting and the reporters were there. And they said, what are you guys talking about? And Newt Gingrich said, oh, we're old friends. We're catching up. We didn't talk about anything involving the campaign, so there was no coordination at all. And, <laughs> and that's that. No one said it, you know. 
And, and the feds got lucky in my case. It was a needle in a haystack kind of case for me. Uh, to have this guy skip, commit all these other crimes, and give up my friend who then wore wire on me. Uh, they, they don't, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a Christmas gift for the prosecutor, is, is basically the only way to put it. Um, and I mean, he thinks he's like the greatest prosecutor in the world, but the case kind of fell into his lap. Um, I'm not, but that's how I feel about our campaign finance regime. Anything in between, any system of rules and regulations inevitably gets circumvented. You know, and that's really what dark money is that you're talking about. Unless you either have, give everything, but report it immediately, and if you get caught not doing so, severe penalty, or public finance. Great question, Michael. What's your name? Mackenzie. Mackenzie. I was just wondering if you're still friends with your friend. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I do forgive him, um, but to be honest, I probably forgive him for selfish reasons. Uh, look, there's a lot of wisdom in prison. You know, I, I talked specifically about the entrepreneurial ingenuity. Um, what I didn't mention is uh, one of the guys in, in that picture um, who I worked with in the warehouse, tall, tall thin guy, uh, he said to me one time, Another prisoner was talking about my best friend, like, what are you going to do to him? He's like, you want me to take care of him? I can, I can, I can get it done. <laughs> and I kind of, I was kind of messing with him. I was like, how much? <laughs> um, and then KY took me aside. He said, look, first of all, don't ever say that. Because people in here might be wearing a wire. And people in here maybe have 10 more, and they can't do 10 more. They only want to do five more. So they'll go, and you would be the perfect guy to, for them to come and tell the warden, look what he said. Look, you know, look what he said. So don't ever humor him like that. He said, but more importantly, you gotta let it go with, with your boy. He's like, my first four years in here, I almost didn't make it. Every day, all I could think about was how I was gonna kill my brother in law. I'd wake up and I'd think about, you know, where I'd shoot him and where I'd, what I'd do with his body. I'd think about it all day, and then I'd go to sleep and I would just toss and turn. And I'd wake up from, from, you know, in a sweat, with my hands gripped around my pillow, like strangling it. And then one day, I realized I was going to kill myself if I couldn't just get him out of my mind. So I, so I forgave him. Uh, he's like, and every day since then has been a little bit easier than the day before. And he was right. It was tremendous wisdom. So I did it to help myself. And I want to spend the rest of my life being friends with the people who stood by me. Those 300 people who wrote letters to the judge on my behalf, I'd do anything for any of those people. Because they were there with me when I needed them. I had 9,000 numbers in my cell phone the day I pled guilty. Yeah, I knew a lot of people in Boston. Uh, you just know, you just do. And about 8,000 of them I didn't hear from. Slowly they trickle back into my life. You know, they say, hey, it's all you on TV, you're doing great, let's get together. Okay. Where were you when I was in prison, you know? Um, I'm not saying it's everyone's responsibility. I'm just saying, I'm going to spend the rest of my life focused on causes I care about and people who had concern for me. And so I forgive him, but no, I'm not good. Good question. What's your name? Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Uh, my question is, when you're talking about the incentive, um, your ideas for incentives to give to the guards say um, the inmates don't come back after yeah. six, 12 months we talked about. Um, do you have any other ideas um, similar to that that would help to lower um, inmate return? Um, so, <laughs> First of all, um, when, we, when we put, so what happens inside prison is so critical, right? I mean, you heard me describe that computer skills class. So like, how do you get a job these days? Like, you don't go pick up a newspaper and read a classified section anymore, do you? You don't go pounding the pavement, knocking on one shop window, and then going to the next store. That's not how you get a job. You get a, you know, so like, we've got to, 
actually teach people how you get, you know, how you get a job, how you apply for a job, how you write a resume. I sat with guys writing, helping them put together resumes. This is one of the most depressing things I've ever seen in my life. I mean, guys, this one guy was helping write a resume. He's got a, a reference. I'm like, who's that? He, uh, he's like, well, that's my uncle. And I'm like, yeah, because it's like same last name. I thought it was a relation. So typically, you, you don't want to put like a family member as a reference. You'll want to put someone who's not related to you because it's like more credible. And he's like, huh. Well, I, I don't really have it. I'm like, well, okay. Okay, well, we could put him. Can, can we put like his company, like where he works and the place he works? Well, uh, he doesn't really work for a company. Okay, well, what's his job? Well, he does odd jobs. Like, what is he? So, like, he gets junk, like scrap metal, like stuff like that, and like sells it. So it's like, that's the like, you know, the best he could do for a reference was an uncle that like, you know, sells junk. Why don't we get in there with like counselors, you know, with job coaches, who are from, you know, basically everyone in a Minnesota prison has, you know, have let's say. 30% of the people are coming back to Duluth from a prison in, you know, wherever in rural Minnesota. And you bring in once a week somebody, you know, a plumber to say, you know, here's, are, would you be interested in plumbing? And then you get the plumber's union, you know, government provides a stipend for the plumber's union to do a six-month apprenticeship program inside the prison. And then you survey the prisoners, you know, you survey all the prisoners and you say, look, Pick your top five professions. Put an X on your top five out of these 20 professions. And let's say it's plumbing, welding, carpentry, um, landscaping, you know, and home health care. Something like, you know, so you bring in people who are qualified to train in those four areas, and then you have an, employ an employer fair, like a job fair, you know, for people who are coming out. You literally do it, you know, at the prison so that like these guys can come home. When these guys come home, they don't have a cent. They have to pay, in many cases, accumulated child support that was accumulating while they were locked up. They have to pay court fees that they still owe from before. They have to pay the halfway house where they're staying. They have to pay for the drug testing that's court mandated. And a landlord won't rent to them. Like, how are they gonna get good, good enough clothes, even decent enough clothes, to look presentable at an interview? I mean, we're just setting people up to fail. So like, let's move a lot of this stuff up in the process so that while people are incarcerated, they can see hope. Because some of these guys, they just didn't have any hope. They didn't see, they didn't have any vision of how they could be a successful, you know, landscaper or plumber or welder. And those jobs cannot go to Mexico. No, you know, no, you can't send your toilet to Mexico to get it unclogged. You know, you've got to have a plumber here who knows how to do that. And like, I live in New York City, but like, you know, you got to pay 350 bucks to even get a plumber to come out and look at your, at a toilet or a plumbing problem. These are good jobs and we need people to do them and we don't have enough for, you know, for a lot of, in a lot of these trades in this country right now. So why don't we, you know, so my number one thing we need to do is to basically find a way, you know, to, for government to understand that like, you're going to be paying unemployment for these people. You're going to be playing, paying their welfare. And ultimately, assuming they reoffend, which is sadly a pretty safe assumption when three quarters of them are doing it, you're going to be paying a ton of money for, you know, uh, to lock it back up. And then there's public safety costs. There's costs related to victimization, right? For any house they break into or car they break into. It would be such a minimal investment if we would do some of these things on the front end. So just to try to get, that's what I'm doing now, you know, is I'm trying to get policymakers to understand the trade-offs that they're making. And yes, it may not be politically popular to spend, you know, an extra million dollars for a state to provide good vocational training in prison, but it's gonna save you $20 million in five years if you do it. So. Uh, really good question, and I think like you know the the money for the CEOs. I just think like there's a lot of way to people's you know hearts, but like their pocketbook is the fastest, and it's the best way. I still don't know of a better way to change behavior 
than to say, you want to make $1,000 every six months, you know, that's your family vacation for this year. Uh, then, you know, this guy flies straight, there's your vacation. And that can add up, you know, if recidivism really drops dramatically. And uh, just what a better way to do things. In a lot of those countries I mentioned in Europe, being a prison guard is almost as prestigious as being a professor. You go through years of training and you make good money. What if instead of it being such a bottom of the barrel job in this country, we actually made it, you know, a decent job that drew much more educated and qualified people? That would be another big step. So all of these things I think are, are inextricably intertwined. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, you know, that's what I'm hoping is that sharing some of this stuff and, and, and the book can, uh, and speaking to, to a lot of policymakers, can help change some of these perverse incentives. <laughs> Rosemary? Did you, in your book, um, um, support the idea of not sending them to prison in the first place? Do I support the idea, Rosemary asked, of not sending people to prison in the first place? Keeping them in the community and doing service. So look, um, I'm not, Angela Davis, who's a, she was a black man right now, she's a scholar, you know, she writes about like total decarceration, like eliminating prisons. I'm not in that camp. It's not, I don't think it's reasonable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah, but yes, I write a lot about like, I mean, I think any, almost any drug offender, almost any nonviolent drug offender, um, their first time offense should just have a bracelet, right? And the bracelets now are so unobtrusive, people don't even know you have them on. You know, it's almost like having a live strong or live strong, whatever thing on. Um, and the country, instead of spending, on average, about $35,000 a year to incarcerate you, would be spending less than one-tenth of that to monitor you on an electronic bracelet. Uh, so, yeah, I think probably, you know, about half the people I was locked up with should have been home with a bracelet, with their family. Actually, you know, the guys I worked with in the warehouse, working in a FedEx warehouse, you know, you're making 50,000 bucks a year. You know, if you're doing, you know, you're making 20 bucks an hour, you know, 25 bucks an hour, like, you can make a good living, you know, and given the success of Amazon and like other, you know, uh, some company, there's a lot of need, there's a lot of jobs like that out there. And almost every guy I worked with in the warehouse, that's what they should have been doing. Making 50,000 bucks and paying 10,000 bucks a year in income and sales taxes, as opposed to costing the government, federal government, about $50,000 a year, uh, which is what they were doing. Federal prisons are more per capita than state prisons. So yes, I totally support having more people in their communities, because who is the next generation of people committing crimes? People who's overwhelmingly, people whose parents are in prison. And so if we can keep fathers and mothers with their children, not, it's going to have a great short-term impact on the parents and a great long-term impact on the kids. Or at least minimize a lot of the you know, negative things that are, that are currently going on. Good question. One last question. If that's cool. Is that all right? Yep. Um, I just wanted to know what your influence could be within the government um, to perform these reforms or these prison reforms. That's a great question. Um, so, uh, if I ever decided to run for office again, the day that I would go to the courthouse to file, I would run into my wife at the courthouse filing for divorce, so I'm not ever going to do that. Um, and I should tell you that, before I finish answering, um, oops, okay. Yeah, speaking of that, uh, that's my wife, and there's my kiddos. Two days before, um, two days before I found out that my best friend was wearing a wire, she had moved into my house, but she hadn't unpacked her boxes yet. And so I had to go to her job 
um, and you say, look, you probably shouldn't unpack. Uh, and in fact, I'm probably going to have to go away for a long time. Um, I had no idea how long it was going to be. But uh, anyway, um, so she stayed with me. So I'm definitely not going to like mess that up now. Because um, <laughs> most guys, you know, they go to prison and that's the last time they ever see the woman they're involved with, especially if they have long bids. And others, the woman will stick around for three, four years, and then one day, like, they're supposed to get a visit on Saturday and she doesn't come, and they just don't ever hear from her again. I mean, I heard, if I heard this story once, I heard it a dozen times. So, what I'm doing to try to have an impact on government is I speak, I've spoken to the Idaho State Legislature, I've spoken to the Missouri State Legislature, I've spoken to the Kentucky State Legislature, the Mississippi State Legislature, the New York State Legislature. I speak to different legislatures around the country. I work with the Speaker of the City Council in New York City. I've influenced a lot of her reforms on bail reform and some of her proposals on Rikers Island. Um, I'm, and I'm actually leaving my professorship in about a month. I'm, designing my, my job to go work in prison reentry full-time back home in St. Louis. Uh, and I'll be the executive vice president for public policy and community engagement for what aspires to be like the leading national organization finding evidence-based solutions to reduce recidivism. So uh, in that role, I'm hoping to have to continue expanding my impact on the policy process. Uh, and blessedly, like a lot of my former colleagues in Missouri, when they're working on criminal justice stuff, seek me out for my advice because, you know, um, unfortunately, I have experience on the other side. And uh, it was a worse year of my life, without a doubt. And telling my parents what was going to happen was the hardest probably moment of my life, other than seeing my parents the time they visited me, which was probably the work hardest scene to write in the book. Uh, but I knew that I didn't want to let that year just not mean anything. And so the last five years, and hopefully you know, the next 15 or 20, uh, will be about trying to take the unique perspectives I have as a former lawmaker, a policy scholar, and a prisoner. Because not many people get to see a problem from all three sides like that, and, uh, and try to leverage that into getting some of these reforms passed around the country. Thanks so much for your question. Thank you all for being here. And if you want to get a book, I will sign books in the back.